one of the things that I miss, and I know this isn't for everyone, right? I know we got extroverts and introverts and, and everything, but one of the things I miss is being able to do the meet and greet and go around and say hi to folks during our church service. And I, you can't do that right now, okay? You can't turn, shake hands, hug. Uh, we're trying to keep that social distancing as best we can, but you could turn to someone close to you. And here's what I want you to say. Just say, God's glad you're here. All right, can you do that? Oh, wow, that was enthusiastic, folks. All right, let's try it again. Turn to someone and say, God's glad you're here. All right, very good. And that's true. If you think that's true, say amen. amen. Okay, it is true. Would you open God's word to Matthew chapter 7 this morning? Matthew chapter 7 this morning. That's where we're going to find ourselves together. As you get there, let me say this, most Christians are familiar with certain passages of the Bible. I mean, there are just verses that seem to speak to our heart, that encourage us, that we love. What's one that we all know? John what? 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Here's another one, Philippians 4.13, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Don't we love these verses? Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the what? Good of those who love him have been called according to his purpose. 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety is what I had, but that's good too. Cares on him because he cares for you. Ephesians 2, 10. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And then you jump back to the Old Testament, and everyone loves this one. Sometimes it's misquoted, but we all love it. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Isaiah 41.10, so do not fear, for I am with you. And we can, all these verses that we love and they speak to us, they're awesome verses. They're church verses. They're verses we use to encourage other people in the body of Christ when we know that they've been going through a hard time. These are verses that help us walk through the valley. But you know, these are not the verses maybe the world knows the best. One verse the world knows really well and uses it often to talk to, to Christians, maybe to refute us a little bit, is this one. Do not, that's probably more known by the world than those other verses I just shared. Maybe next to John 3, 16, that might be the most known verse by folks that are still seeking, folks that don't understand, maybe folks that have chosen not to follow God. Do not judge. Atheists, agnostics uh, will incorrectly take this verse out of context and use it against Christians. And what we've allowed is we've heard it so much that we do close down if we hear that verse. Do not judge. We're not sure how to answer back. And the reason for that is we don't understand the context of it. I did something different this week. I reached out to several folks in our church. Some of you probably got messages from me. And I just asked you, hey, look over this passage this week. Look over this passage. Tell me some of your thoughts about Matthew chapter 7, 1 through 4. I kind of did a mobile uh, life group, if you will. This week is life group sign up. We've got four groups. We'll have more. I've got people that are willing to do more if we fill up those four groups. But check out the board today. But I did a mobile life group. And what it allows us to do is to talk about the text together. There's things that you guys said this week that really spoke to my heart. The way that God was speaking to you helped me to grow. And that's what life groups are all about. So we did this mobile life group, and one person said this. They said, this verse is complicated and oftentimes misunderstood. And that's exactly right. Even for the Christian, this verse can be complicated and, and misunderstood. And so we're going to dive into that text today, and we're going to look at that text together. But I want to do a simple prayer. You don't even have to close your eyes for this. I'm going to say the prayer, and at the end, you just say amen, okay? Real simple prayer. God, would you help us to grow as we look to your word together? And you say amen. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. Do not judge... Or you too will be judged. For in the same way you in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, "Let me take that speck out of your eye," when all the time there's this plank in your own? 
you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This is where we're finding ourselves in the Sermon on the Mount as we continue through this higher series. There's this story that's been told of a prosecuting attorney in a small town courthouse who called his first witness up to the stand, an elderly woman. And he approached her and he asked, Mrs. Jones, do you know me? She responded, why, yes, I do know you, Mr. Williams. I've known you since you were a young boy, and frankly, you've been a big disappointment to me. You lie, you cheat, you manipulate people and talk about them behind their backs. You think you're a rising big shot, but you haven't the brains to realize you will never amount to anything more than a two-bit paper pusher. Yes, I know you. Taken back, the lawyer who was stunned, looked over and pointed to across the room and said, well, do you know the defense attorney? And she replied, why, of course I do. I've known Mr. Bradley since he was a youngster too. I used to babysit him. And he too has been a real disappointment to me. He's lazy, bigoted, has a drinking problem. The man can't build a normal relationship with anyone. And his law practice is one of the shoddiest in the entire state. Yes, I know him. And at this point, the judge brought the courtroom to silence with his gavel and called both lawyers up to his bench and in a very quiet voice and said with menace, he said, if either of you ask her if she knows me, I'll hold you in contempt of court. (laughs) Right? People are really good. People are really good at pointing out the faults of others. But maybe that is putting it too generally. Let me make it more personal. You are quite skilled at noticing the faults of others. You're quite skilled at it. And maybe you're you're like, I don't I'm not me. Surely not me. The word Jesus used for judge can mean to analyze, to evaluate, to condemn. So maybe sometimes the way you do it, you're like, well I'm not judging, I'm just, you know, evaluating this other person. I'm just analyzing, you know, trying to help them out. I'm good at evaluating the shortcomings of others. My wife, who would, if she wasn't back in the classroom, would probably say amen right then, right? Ah, I struggle with it. Yeah, I had one, and my parents will probably watch. I love you guys. But I had one parent that was very good at evaluating the other parent. And we've talked about it because I think in some ways, you know, I've become that same. You don't want to turn in your mom or dad, but what happens? Yeah, you pick up some of that stuff. And so I'm guilty of this myself. We easily notice the smallest things about someone else, and maybe we don't make them public. And so you feel better about it, but you do say it to those you trust the most. Maybe a spouse, maybe someone in your house, maybe a trusted coworker, or neighbor. We evaluate, we notice defaults, flaws, imperfections, failures. But to help us out with this, just real quick, something you can do just in your mind. Think of the three worst things you've ever done. Go. You know what? Some of you are like, I can't think of anything. You know why? Because we're good at noticing it in other people. It's harder to notice it in ourselves. Jesus said, do not judge or you too will be judged. That verse makes me think Jesus knows us a little bit better than we think. He knows how we are. I'll share a poetic story that I came across in my studies. A woman was waiting at an airport one night with several long hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in the airport shop, bought a bag of cookies, and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book, but happened to see that the man beside her, as bold as could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag between, which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. She watched cookies and watched the clock as the gutsy cookie thief diminished her stock. She was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking if it wasn't so nice, it wasn't so nice I'd blacken his eye. With each cookie she took, he took one too. When only one was left, she wondered what he'd do. With a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. He offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from his and thought, oh brother, this guy has some nerve and he's also rude. Why he didn't even show any gratitude. 
She had never known when she had been so galled and sighed with relief when her flight was finally called. She gathered her belongings and headed to the gate, refusing to look back at that thieving ingrate. She boarded the plane and sank in her seat, then sought her book, which was almost complete. As she reached in her baggage, she gasped with surprise. There was a bag of cookies in front of her eyes. If mine are here, she moaned with despair, then the others were his, and he tried to share. Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate. She was the thief. Somehow people, and I'm not talking about Christians and non-Christians, I'm talking about humanity, I'm talking about people, find it so much easier to find the negative conclusions about others than to assume the best about them. I don't know why that is. And I know we don't like to admit this, but there's something in us. I don't know if it's just the fallenness of our sinfulness, what it is, but there's something about us that sometimes our brains, whether we make it vocal or not, we go down that path. So Jesus said to believers, to those who would follow him, he said this, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus was continuously looking around, and he's looking at religious folks. He's preaching not to the folks outside the doors. He's preaching to the folks sitting in the pews. Maybe I can put it this way. If we give a teaspoon, I heard this from another preacher, if we give a teaspoon of grace to others, we should not expect a dump truck load of grace from God. But we love that, don't we? We're like, oh, God's grace. Man, I need it. I'm such a mess. And then when it comes to others, man, it's like a little spoon of grace that we're willing to share. Here's the truth. The one who has every right to judge you is who? Help me out here. The one who has every right to judge you is who? God. And he offers you grace. That's a good God. So what's this mean? Does this mean we can't discern and make judgments about the character of people? Does this mean we can't look at someone's actions and say, yeah, that's right or that's wrong? Is that what this means? No. Does this mean we can't have conversations about political things, serious things going on in our culture, things we need to discuss, even though it's not politically right? Does that mean we can't talk about those things? That's not what God's saying here. But that's how the culture looks at this verse. Do not judge. You can't judge me. Many of you are familiar with Planet Fitness. Raise your hands. Right? right? That's a judgment-free gym. Right? You go there. This isn't for those guys that are like, you know, super built and the ladies that are, you know, ripped. No, that's not. The Planet Fitness is supposed to be a judgment-free zone. And they did fantastic with this marketing because our culture loves that. They want to live their life, and it's a judgment-free zone. Don't judge me. The non-Christian world is quick to say that to us. And they'll also use a word that Jesus used in his text here. If we question something, if we start a conversation, if we say, is this right or wrong? They're quick to use a word that starts with H. What's the word? Hypocrite. You hypocrite. You judged me. It even says it in the book you believe. Don't judge. You do what's best for you, and let me do what's best for me. But that isn't what Jesus is saying. That's why this is complicated and oftentimes taken out of context. If we jump to the end of Matthew 7, you don't have to turn there. You can look later. But at the end of chapter 7, Jesus, in the very same text, just a few verses later, Jesus says this. He says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. How could we recognize them by their fruit if we are not able to? to make a judgment, to discern. We had a lady in this church, many of you who remember her, especially folks that were in Sunday school class with her, she used to joke around, she said, I'll be your fruit checker, right? Some of you might remember, I'll check your fruit for you. She loves you enough. She'll let you know if your fruit's not adding up. God expects us to recognize evil to recognize sin, unrighteousness, selfishness, anger, corruption, struggles, temptations. How could we ever make a judgment on what we are being tempted on if we weren't allowed to make judgments? God expects us to dialogue things. 
we're supposed to be able to talk with other brothers and sisters in Christ about these things, the things where we're struggling, and maybe we're not seeing them, and so we allow them to speak into us. That, a lot of that happens in life groups. I mean, that's the opportunity for those conversations. But we must balance this with what Jesus said. Right? It's not as black and white as we love it. Man, sometimes it's like that with Jesus. We have to balance it. Look at verse 3 of our text. Why do you look at the, the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? This last week, uh, my daughter Jenny, she's been talking about wanting to be a cowgirl forever. No idea where this came in her mind because we've never been around um, horses. Uh, I don't know where it came from. Maybe a Sheriff Callie a cartoon. I don't know. Somehow she's made up in her mind that she wants to be a cowgirl. I'm thankful my other daughter says she wants to be a surgeon, so I figure some, some way one of them will take care of me uh, when Jenny will ride me to church on her horse and I'll live with Anna, so it'll work out. But we went to uh, the Coleman's ranch, and Sean Coleman's a teacher, and he, he was the one that was going to give my daughter a lesson. And even though his horses didn't have those things that go over the eyes, in Jenny's mind, she's thinking about, I've seen horses before, and they have these things over their eyes. And she said, what is that? And he said, well, that's a, that's a mask to keep flies away from their eyes. And she didn't understand, like, well, how can, how can the horse see then? And, and Sean said, well, actually, when it's that close, the horse can see through it really well and can see to where it needs to go, to food, to water, to get around. And I think about somehow, as I was listening to him explain this, I was thinking about my sermon, somehow we can look right past all of our stuff and we can see so well the stuff that other people are dealing with. And Jesus says, be careful. It's easy to see that speck over there. It's a lot harder to see that plank. I asked Dan yesterday if he could get me a plank that I could use this morning. And I think he said something like, well, what type? I'm like, I don't know, wood, right? Or that maybe that's what I said. I didn't say that to you, right? Wood's wood. Okay, but I think Jesus must have had a sense of humor when he was saying this. Because can you imagine someone being like, hey, you got a speck in your eye. Let me get that for you, right? I'm like, oh, let me, right? How comfortable would you feel if you went to the eye doctor and the eye doctor walked into the room and was like, well, I had an accident yesterday, but let me check out your eyes for you. All right? And you're like, no, I don't think so. I, you know, in this moment, I feel like Jesus must have had a sense of humor as he was sharing this. But yet that's what we do. We look right past it and we notice it. And so Jesus is saying, yeah, do we need to make judgments? Yeah, we do. You have to. You've got to recognize truth. You've got to call sin, sin. It's not going to be popular, but you got to do it. Same time, he's saying, hey, consider what you're dealing with as you're doing this. Consider yourself. Speak truth. Give grace. So here's some principles. We're going to go through these real quick. There's six of them. Six principles, and it's in like a short amount of time, five minutes. So you got to work with me. Okay, write these down if you're a note taker. Here's the first thing. These are principles that can help us in speaking truth and also giving grace. Here's the first one. Remember God's heart for you. Remember first, before you're ready to go and have a tough discussion with someone, confront something, remember God's heart for you. Consider what Jesus did with your sin. When we were supposed to be judged by the Father, Jesus stepped in the flesh to take on the consequences of our judgment. That's what Jesus did for you. So remember God's heart. One person in our church, as I sent out messages this week, said this, we have the easiest foundation for loving and respecting others because our foundation is that of how Christ reached out to us. We have the easiest foundation for this. That was number one. So what was number one? All right. Remember God's heart for you. Here's the second one. Start with your own heart. Start with your heart. How can I get this plank out of my eye? Someone asked that. Someone I talked to, one of you, said that to me this week. They're like, ah, I've read through this. I've been thinking about it. How do I get the plank out of my own eye so I can help my brothers and sisters in Christ? 
How do I get it out of there? Now, Jesus is not saying you have to be sinfully perfect, right? Anybody here perfect, never sinned, right? Raise your hand. Let me see it because I, I need you to come, you know, teach the rest of us. No. So we'll never be perfect. And if you're waiting to be perfect before you start to help out brothers and sisters in Christ, you'll never get there. And that's not what Jesus expects. But ask yourself, is your heart in the right place to talk to someone else about their struggles? The only way you can figure that out is by spending some time in self-evaluation, some self-reflection, which is not our norm. Many of us probably don't make time because it's a hard part. It's a hard part of going deeper in our faith. It's a hard part of having a higher understanding of things. Many of us don't do our part at self-evaluation. We're not intentional enough with that. Here's an example I want to share with you. It's from Luke chapter 18. And you probably know this story. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down at everyone else, Jesus told this parable. The two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, a religious guy, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and, and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax cl collector stood at a distance he would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. That needs to be the attitude. Before we ever go, we need to go to God, examine our own hearts and say, I'm a sinner and I need help. So the first one was, okay, you guys are already forgetting. Remember God's heart for you. The second one, start with your heart. The third one. Here's some just practical advice. You can like someone, but not like everything they do or promote, and that's okay. Is it okay to have people of different worldviews and different beliefs around you that are friends? That's okay. If we want people to respect us and listen to our Christian worldview and give us a chance to share Christ with them, then guess what? You're going to have to respect them and listen to them as they share about their life and where they're at and why they struggle, and their doubts, and their concerns, and why the Bible's difficult for them, and why accepting Jesus would be hard for them. You have to be willing to do the same. And this goes along with that old saying, you guys know this, you can love the sinner and hate the sin, right? Or maybe we can say it this way, you can give unconditional love without giving unconditional approval. Let me say that again. You can give unconditional love without giving unconditional approval. So that's number three. Number four, speak the way you hope others would speak to you. Be respectful, considerate, empathetic, loving, kind, caring. Your goal should never be taken, never, your goal should never be to make someone else feel bad by your words. If that's your goal, like I tell you what, I'm offended right now and I'm going to go tell them exactly what I think, right? I do this sometimes. Whew, and I have to back away, maybe talk to someone in the church, like, here's what I'm thinking. And I need people sometimes to remind me, I'm not sure your heart is in the right place. Speak, number four, speak the way you hope others would speak to you. Number five, judge fairly. And with the same standard, you're okay to be judged. John chapter 7, verse 24 says this, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Don't judge people before you even know them based on uh, clothes, uh, what they're wearing, how they're talking, the color of their skin, their social status, their economic status. Not good reasons to judge someone. Don't point out their sin and leave them in the dark. Right? I think sometimes we can do that, like, you're doing wrong, you're doing this, and you just tell them all the bad, and then you leave them out there, and you feel better because you got it off your chest. Well, you just told someone they're in the dark and you never pointed them towards any light. Ephesians 4.15, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. The point, any time we have to have hard conversations, is to help them grow, to be more mature in Jesus Christ. And when someone comes and talks to you, we need to be humble enough to know that Ephesians 4.15 is truth and maybe they're coming to you to talk to you about something hard because they really, in their heart, want to help you to grow. Why do you think God made elders? 
over churches. Because sometimes elders just don't have an easy job all the time. Sometimes they have to go to someone, they have to go to families, and they have to have a hard conversation. Why? So they can make those people feel bad, so they never want to come back to church again? No, of course not. Their goal is to help people to grow so that they're more like Christ. So number five was judge fairly with the same standard you're okay to be judged. And the last one, even after all of this, people may not like you. People may not like you, they may not like what you believe, and that's okay. I mean, that's just how it is. In this world, we're not always going to be the most popular for speaking truth. But if you spoke truth, and you've given grace, and you've done it with the right heart, and they're still a little frustrated, a little upset with you, don't care for you, that's okay. But make sure you've done it the right way. Right now in California, one of the pastors I like to listen to, one of the pastors I love, an article came out this week that they were sued, sued for $20,000 for meeting last Sunday. And they were going to meet again this Sunday. And it's going to be another $20,000. They're going to be up to $40,000 that they're trying to fine them with for meeting. Folks, this COVID stuff, we've gotten so judgmental across the country about this. And we've got to make sure our heart's in the right place with it. I want to end with something that uh, one of the young ladies in our church actually shared with me as I sent out this mobile life group and, and uh, was asking people their opinions on this verse, asked them pray about it, think about it. This came back to me, and I love this, and I want to share this because I think sometimes we wrestle with God because the church hasn't done a good job at loving us while calling sin, sin. And it's chased people away from the church. It's chased people in a community away from even considering going to church. And so this person said this, and I really like this. This young lady who said, and this is how we'll close today, opinions of those here on earth is in as, our, as how our Father looks at us. I mean, that's the judge. And he did something to give us a lot of grace over his judgment. His judgment wasn't evil. He was right on. It was good. It was true. But then he sent Jesus to give us grace. So your main concern is making sure that you're ready when that time comes, that the Father looks at you and sees the Son. That's what matters most. If you've not made that decision, make sure to talk to me today. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful uh, to continue to go through uh, this Sermon on the Mount, passage by passage, verse by verse, and man, it just, it's challenging sometimes because uh, it's just not as black and white as maybe we'd like it to be, and, and yes, we're supposed to stand up uh, for truth, and yes, we're supposed to give grace, and yes, we're supposed to hold each other accountable, and yes, we need to make sure our hearts are right as we do it, and, and we're supposed to find our balance somewhere there in the middle, living both of those out together. And that is hard. And so, Father, we ask that you just help our hearts um, today, this week, uh, to maybe apply this more to our life, to think about how this can actually make us more Christ-like in the next seven days of our life, how it can make us more Christ-like today when we leave here. Father, we are thankful for your Son. We're thankful for your Holy Spirit. Thankful for this time that we can come together as a church to worship and praise. And Father, we pray that this was a sweet offering before you. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. We all say it. Amen.